Welcome to another aero terminology video from the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. In this series of videos, we talk about aerodynamic terms that are used in designing ultralight airplanes and other airplanes. And they're used just to supplement the design video so we don't have to keep iterating over and over what the definition of a term is. In this particular video, we are going to talk about the coefficient of moment. In the literature, you'll see the coefficient of moment represented by the letter C with a sub M, and that could be a capital or lowercase m. In order to talk about what a moment is, we need to talk a little bit about how air pressure is going to affect our wing. I've used the XLFT5 software to draw up the effects of air pressure on a wing. In this case, we're using the NACA4415 airfoil. It has a thickness of 15%. The maximum thickness occurs at 30% of the cord. The maximum camber is 4% of the cord, which is what this initial four is. That where that maximum camber occurs is at 40% of the cord, and that's the second four up here in the number and that 15% thickness is this one five here at the end of this four digit number. In this particular case the airfoil is at a four degree angle of attack and I've used a Reynolds number pretty close to one million. In our case that's close to a three foot cord at about a stall speed of 24 knots. These dark green arrows that you see surrounding this airfoil represent the air pressure at that little portion of the airfoil. In this case, you can see these arrows are pointing up. Since it's pointing away from the airfoil, that's a negative pressure, so it's pulling the airfoil up. Down here, where you can see these arrows pointing toward the airfoil, that's a positive pressure, but in, down here, since they're on the bottom, it's also pushing the airfoil up. Now, you can actually see the lift distribution on this airfoil by based on the length of these arrows. The longer the arrow is, the greater the magnitude of the air pressure. So you can see at the tip, it's close to zero. It rapidly grows up to a maximum at about 15, 20% of the cord, and then gradually tapers off to zero back at the trailing edge of the cord. And just as a quick aside, when we go to do wing load tests, on the spar and on the wing. This is also how we would distribute the weight on the wing. We will put the majority of the weight up here and less of it down here. And you can actually see this pressure distribution up here. This is a coefficient of pressure. And it kind of gives you an idea of what the magnitude of that pressure is on the top and then also on the bottom of the cord. Now, in some literature you will see this represented as just a triangle with the maximum up here at the leading edge and then following up at the trailing edge and that's just a rough approximation to show you what the load distribution is across the cord of a wing. Now in a lot of our calculations we just want a single number for our lift and we want to know where that is along the cord and that's represented by this arrow here. You integrate from leading edge to trailing edge all these pressures and you can approximate all of that with a single lift number at a single position along the cord. Now this position and of course the length of this arrow representing how much lift we have will change with the angle of attack. As I said our angle of attack was four degrees. As the angle of attack increases you will generally see this position of this lift move forward. As it decreases of course it moves back. And just as a side, uh, if you want to go back and review the coefficient of lift aerodynamic term, we have a coefficient of lift here of almost 0.1. It's 0.919. And as a, a something to remember when we get to our next slide, coefficient of moment is minus 0.1. Now you may be able to notice that this position of this lift is a little bit back of the 25% cord. So here's about 50%, here's about 25%. And that's almost always going to be the case. Well, now let's go to the next slide and talk about how we can use the position of this lift to figure out our moment for our wing. Well, we need to talk about a little bit about what moment is. So a moment you can think of like torque, and it has the same units as torque. The units would be distance times force. So like foot-pounds, for example. 
Now, if you'll remember, we were looking at this arrow in the previous slide. So this is the lift at some position along the cord. What is our moment? Our moment then is going to be this lift, which in our case is going to be pounds, multiplied by distance. And so it's going to be the distance between the, where the lift is and some reference point. And that'll be our distance. It's also called an arm. Well, it turns out that we usually use the 25% cord as our reference point. And there's a reason for that. Many, many decades ago, the early pioneers in aerodynamic design figured out that if you use the 25% cord, your moment is going to be nearly constant as you change your angle of attack. Now remember we said in the previous slide, as you increase your angle of attack, this position of the lift generally moves forward. As you reduce the angle of attack, it generally moves back. Now also think about this. The lift increases as you increase the angle of attack. So arm gets smaller, lift gets bigger. So there ought to be a point, hopefully, where that moment, lift times arm, will be constant. And they found out that out of the 25% cord or a little bit in front of it, it could be down to 23% cord, that arm times lift is almost constant. So we will almost always have our moment referenced to that 25% cord. Now, there is a caveat to this. This is really only accurate, and accurate is kind of relative term, but it's most accurate at angles of attack between 0 and 12 degrees. And that's for most airfoils. After you get above 12 degrees, your lift slope is no longer linear, and so it's harder for it to be accurate. As that lift slope starts curving over, as you get closer to stall, then this moment is no longer going to be constant about that 25% cord. But for most conditions, like climb, cruise, it's pretty accurate. We've talked about how to calculate the moment of the wing. Now, how do we calculate the coefficient of moment of the wing? Now, the coefficient of moment has no dimensions. What we would like to do is convert this moment that we talked about in the previous slide into something without dimensions. In order to do that, we need to get rid of all the units that our moment has. Now, why do we want this coefficient of moment? Why do we want it to be dimensionless? It makes it much easier to compare airfoils, to compare the coefficient of moment between airfoils. We don't have to worry about the cord or the surface area or the speed of the wing. That's much easier to compare apples to apples. What we need to do then is to get rid of our dimensions. We'll get rid of the dynamic pressure, which has dimensions of speed squared and air density. We will get rid of the surface area of the wing and we will get rid of the core of the wing. So any dimensions of the wing now are taken out of our moment. And by the way, in the previous video, we talked about the mean aerodynamic cord. This is when we use our mean aerodynamic cord. And we use it here for the cord when we're calculating our coefficient of moment. Now we don't normally really have to calculate coefficient of moment. I'm just talking about how it can be calculated. Generally, we are given coefficient of moment for an airfoil. We don't have to go calculate it. And over here, I used the same program that I used showing the coefficient of pressure in an earlier slide. The XFLT5 program can give you a coefficient of moment versus angle of attack, and that's what we're looking at here. In this case, there are two different airfoils that we're comparing. This blue line represents the coefficient of moment versus angle of attack for the NACA4415 airfoil, and that's the one we looked at earlier. This red line is for a general aviation airfoil that Harry Riblet came up with, and this is the 30U-415 airfoil. Along with the 4415 airfoil, this is also a turbulent designed airfoil. Now as you can see, these numbers over here on coefficient of moment are negative, so the farther up on the graph it is, the smaller the number is, the closer to zero. By convention, a negative coefficient of moment is pitching forward. In other words, it's trying to rotate counterclockwise as you're looking from the left end of the wing. If the coefficient of moment is positive, that means it's actually trying to rotate clockwise, nor the nose is trying to pitch up. But that only happens if your center of lift is in front of that 25% reference point on the wing. So as you can see from this graph, coefficient of moment for the NACA airfoil has a greater magnitude than the coefficient of moment for the riblet airfoil. 
And that's one of the reasons that the NACA airfoil, the, at least this four digit version of the airfoil is not used very much anymore. Coefficient of moment is greater and that's less desirable. And I was just talking about how the coefficient of moment is generally constant around that 25% chord point. And you can see from roughly zero up to 10 or 12, it's about a factor foil for the riblet airfoil. It's a little bit less for the NACA airfoil. That may seem like a lot, but if we were to compare it against, let's say the leading edge reference point, the difference between this, the minimum and maximum, at least between zero and 10 degrees, would be far, far grayer. In between the 23% and 25%, this difference is usually going to be the minimum. You might want to download the XFLT program and play around with it a little bit. It uh, shows you a lot more diagrams also that you'll find interesting when trying to compare airfoils. We've mentioned before that we'd like to have a small coefficient of moment because it makes the tail force a little bit less. Let's figure out why that is. So how are we going to use the coefficient of moment? About the only thing we use it for is figuring out the tail force or canard force for using a canard configuration. The tail or canard has to be used to counter that moment caused by the wing. It also has to counter the moment caused by the weight of the airplane in relation to the center of lift. We're going to ignore that airplane weight moment for now and only talk about the moment caused by the wing because that's what we're really talking about is the CSMM in this video. In a future video, we'll talk about the airplane moment also when we start getting into longitudinal stability of an airplane. So how are we going to calculate that force that a horizontal tail or a canard has to exert to counter that wing moment? Basically, we just rearrange the equation we looked at previously. Let me zip back to that. This equation here can just be rearranged. Take this quantity and move it over to this side and then change our moment into a force times the length. And that's what we're doing here. We've got our coefficient of moment times our dynamic pressure, surface of the wing, core of the wing, and we have, we've taken our moment, which would have been over here, divided it into the force times the length, and we've moved the length over here. So all we did is just rearrange our equation. And that lets us then calculate the force needed by the tail. We take all this and divide by the distance, and we haven't really talked about this now, what's this distance? It's not the moment arm for the wing moment, it's the moment arm from the quarter cord of our mean aerodynamic cord to the quarter cord of our horizontal tail, or canard if we're using a canard. So basically the 25% of the MAC to 25% of the horizontal tail. That distance then will be put here, and that tells us what the force of the tail is. Let's talk a little bit about the coordinate systems and the signs for our values so we get the correct signs for either lift up or you could call it lift down or the force down. Normally and almost always your coefficient of moment is going to be negative. So in order to get a downward force on a horizontal tail to have a negative force here, that's what the downward force would be is be negative. Everything else here would have to be positive. So this length would have to be positive. Now generally on aircraft you're going to have a coordinate system for your nose to tail axis. That's generally called the x-axis or longitudinal axis. You have zero up toward the front and that could be something like the prop flange, uh, the very farthest forward point on your airplane, the nose of the airplane, something like that and then your X values will increase as you move toward the tail. So in order to have a positive length then for this value for a horizontal tail, you would take the tail position and subtract the wing position. That would give you a positive number. If you had a canard, you would need a negative value here in order for this negative, this negative to cancel and give you a positive value here, meaning you would have lift at the canard pushing up. In order to have a negative for this length then, you would subtract the canard position from the wing position. That would give you a negative number. Canard would be smaller. You're subtracting a bigger number. That'll give you a negative number. We might calculate our tail force in a few different conditions, in particular angle of attack. 
because if, if you remember in that previous diagram, the moment at, let's say, stall is going to be significantly different than it will be in pulling out of a dive, in a climb, or in cruise. So we might actually have to use several different coefficient moments to figure out what the worst case force is going to be that the horizontal tail has to exert. Well, stay tuned for some more aerial terminology videos. We've got some coming out. We've got a few more coming out shortly that uh, will help in deciding the airfoil we're going to use the UWS-1 Ultralight.